Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, webinar um, on digital for health education. My name is Sally Parsley behind these spectacles, and I'm a learning uh, e-learning developer and technologist at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I'm based with the International Centre for Eye Health, and I'm working on a series of open access uh, online courses with the group there. And we're running these um, webinars, uh, a series of three webinars, um, looking at uh, how uh, educators and learner health professionals can develop their digital skills and capabilities to make the most of the opportunities for learning and teaching that are offered online these days. So I'm going to turn myself off now. I just wanted to show you that I'm a real person, um, <laughs> that, but you don't need to see my face anymore. And we'll get started as quickly as possible. So I'm delighted today we're looking at uh, digital technologies from the viewpoint of uh, the health educator. So, and we have two very experienced educators in their respective fields of ophthalmology and disability studies to talk to us today. And I'm really excited to hear both their presentations. It's a wonderful opportunity over the next half an hour or so to learn from their expertise and experiences of using digital technologies for education and training. Um, before I go any further and um, introduce our first speaker, I just want to do a couple of quick bits of housekeeping. And that is, please be aware that we're going to record this session and we'll be sharing the recording and a transcript uh, with you and putting it on our website afterwards. Um, so the plan is for each speaker to talk for about 10 minutes and then we'll have five minutes with, five minutes with each speaker for to answer your comments and uh, questions in a quick Q&A. So, as you listen to, the, to our speakers, please post your questions and comments uh, using the chat bar, which you should see in the GoToWebinar menu on your screen. So you can post your questions there to me or to the group, and I'll collate the questions and put them to our speakers at the end. So that's the plan. I hope it sounds clear. I'm very excited, and I'm going to start now by introducing uh, our first talker, our first speaker, sorry, uh, Dr. Eduardo Miorga. He's an ophthalmologist with specialisms in refractive and cataract surgery, and he's honorary chief of the ophthalmology service at the, unit, at the Hospital Italiano de Buenos Aires in uh, Argentina. He's an ophthalmic educator and trainer with many years standing, and he has a particular interest and expertise in e-learning. Eduardo is the director of e-learning at the Pan American Association of Ophthalmology and the International Council of Ophthalmology, where he's a member of the editorial board for the Center of Ophthalmic Educators, which I think we're going to learn a bit about today, which is great. And he regularly teaches on e-learning courses at the center. So he's going to talk today, and I'm very excited to hear about it, on the importance of good digital literacy for developing medical continuing professional education, CPD, and how the International Council of Ophthalmology can support educators to do this. So remember to post your questions to Eduardo using the chat bar and we'll answer these afterwards. Let me hand over to you now, Eduardo. I'm just making you a presenter. And I think you're st you're still you're self muted. So when you're ready. Ah, there you go. Oh, okay. Sure. Welcome. There I'll, we I'll mute myself. I'll mute myself now, Eduardo. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Sally. Uh, it's a pleasure to be and an honor to be today with you here to share some of what we're doing at the International Council of Ophthalmology. Uh, I'm going to turn off my camera now and share my screen. Let me know when uh, you have a full screen of my presentation. If it's, can you see it okay? Yes, it, I can see it great, thank you. Okay, so my goal today is to show you how the Center for Ophthalmic Educators belonging to the International Council of Ophthalmology tries to help uh, teachers develop this digital literacy. For this, I'll divide my presentation into four areas. One, telling you about our online courses. Then a little bit more about the Center for Ophthalmic Educators. Then I will show you our technology blog. And finally, end talking about the Ophthalmic Educators Group. The ICO, for those of uh, 
you that are not do not know them well is an international organization that has uh, 103 national ophthalmology societies and 44 international subspecialty societies as members. We work together with other uh, NGOs and with supranational organizations from in ophthalmic and ophthalmology from Asia Pacific, Europe, the Middle East, and, Pan and America. The commitments of the ICO are three, education, that's my area, enhancing A care, and advancing leadership. The first thing I want to introduce to you are our online courses. These online courses are asynchronous uh, courses that, as you know, these are courses when, where everybody can get connected from any part of the world. And there is no need for the teacher to be there at that time because the teaching interventions are stored in the web. Of course, the teacher will interact at the time it's best for them, for the students and for himself uh, through uh, um, forums. The first one I want to talk about is uh, the webinar workshop. We used to give this course to individuals, but um, we now are trying to do it to organizations. The reason for this is because many times individuals really were not able to implement what they learned there, and organizations usually have more possibilities to do this. Basically, what we taught them was all about the technology behind the webinars. We usually used Adobe Connect for this, but there are nowadays there are many uh, different softwares for developing webinars from where you can choose from. But they all have in common, like this one here, go to meeting, where you can see the screen where my presentation will be. You have the possibility to do chat, do quizzes and polls and see at the same time the video of the speaker. This, um, this course uh, prepared them on how to prepare the webinars before, what you need to uh, have ready before you do a success, successful webinar, and during the webinar, how to use the different windows inside the software, how to use presentations, videos, screen sharing, etc. The second one, and the one I like most, is this one called Transforming Lectures into Effective Teaching Interventions. This is also an asynchronous course where we cover different topics such as adult learning theory that helps engage, keep attention, and facilitate learning, how to plan courses that starts with writing good goals and objectives, organizing content, and developing assessments, then how to build the course content, because as most of you are aware of, you can't teach and assess in the same way facts, concepts, procedures, processes, and principles. They all need different strategies, and this is what we cover here. We then went into the multimedia principles, where we join cognitive, what we've learned from cognitive psychology and how to combine multimedia to enhance learning effectiveness. All this runs on a learning management system, Moodle, one of the mostly used uh, free software for handling these kind of courses. We also covered how to use screencast uh, software that allows you to record and then publish your presentations and Socrative uh, free uh, um, answering systems that uses the phones of the learners to answer this in the face-to-face -face classes. The main goal of this course is to help those who are teaching face-to-face -to, -face to move into the e-learning arena. In this course, usually in the first week, uh, the learners uploaded what they believed was their best presentation. And as the course goes by, they start working on it to try to apply everything they've learned. Usually by the end of it, the end with much better and polished presentations than the one they started with. This one is probably the course I most enjoy running. This one has not, not to do with uh, digital literacy, 
but has to do with probably the most important skill any worker in the 25, 21st century, I'm going too fast, <laughs> uh, needs to be successful. And this is critical thinking. Uh, the teachings here are based on what the foundation for critical thinking uh, is teaching based on Richard Paul's teaching. We use books and booklets from here and we cover in different models the definitions for critical thinking, uh, how Richard Paul, uh, Paul classifies the elements of thought in eight areas and how these are analyzed applying intellectual standards. Then we look at the functions of the mind that always work together, such as thinking, feeling and wanting. And we go into uh, talking about sociocentric thinking and egocentric thinking that usually uh, uh, modify a lot of our thought. And finally, we end with how to apply all this to analyzing articles and to solve problems in the clinical settings. The Center for Ophthalmic Education is the place where we, you can find all these resources or reach them. Uh, we've built this area as a separate uh, website from the ICO's website. It's just uh, committed to teaching. The taxonomy we decided to use is to divide this on how to teach, where we uh, publish articles and videos regarding, sorry, regarding um, how to teach, what to teach that uh, goes into developing curriculums for teaching ophthalmology, what to teach with, resources that are used for teaching, how to assess and what to assess with. It has a search engine that allows you to search all these areas on their own. We also have a technology blog that started, I think, in 2010, where we try to keep a monthly post on how to use technology for teaching and learning. In this case, this blog, uh, this post uh, is about how to give feedback, whether formative or summative, using um, screencast software. And finally, I wanted to mention the Ophthalmic Educators Group. This is a group we're trying to form in everybody related to ophthalmology is invited to uh, become a member. Uh, you can find uh, more information on this on our website. And the idea is to keep all those interested in teaching in le and learning and uh, the area related to ophthalmology together so they can learn from each other and exchange ideas from each other. Of course, in such a short time, I don't have time to cover a lot of other uh, digital competencies that are needed. Uh, to do all this work, uh, especially for an international organization with ours, where our members are spread all over the world, we need to be competent on a lot of collaboration tools. So other things you probably will need to learn, and we probably will be developing courses specifically for these, are using collaboration tools such as Google Drive, where with all the apps are our main um, a weapon to hold it some way to uh, be able to do shared work on online. Uh, we use software like Follow Up Then that allows your, um, and I have no uh, uh, interest, uh, you know, I don't have no economical interest in this, but we use this to follow up and keep our inbox free to follow up our uh, emails. Screencast-O-Matic, another free software that allows you to record and narrate your presentations to put up on the, to the web. Software like Todoist, that is a to-do list that also shared on site, helps groups work together. Evernote, a, ple a place to uh, collect all of what you find on the web, because today probably it's more about curating good teaching interventions that are already on the web than producing them. We just try to produce what we don't find. And finally, another software we use a lot and that we believe learners and teachers in this digital age need to master are the, um, the software for mind maps. 
that allows for students to develop their deep learning and for uh, teachers to develop uh, documents that will help fight the forgetting curve you always have after a teaching intervention. So I'm 20 seconds past my 10 minutes, and I think this is all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edward. 20 seconds is amazing. <laughs> it's a very long time. That was ever. So, that was terrible. That was. I really enjoyed that. For I mean, lots of things. You packed so much into ten minutes. I particularly enjoyed learning a bit more about the e-learning modules which are offered by the ICO, and also you gave me ideas for um, adding more inter interactivity to our webinars. You know, you making the most of the active learning opportunities that this all this technology affords us. So thank you. Um, we've had a question in from Mustafa Abbature. I hope I've pronounced that right, Mustafa, I apologize. And that is, how, please, how can we have access to the multimedia tools mentioned uh, from ICO? Well, um, I've, I've sent you this um, presentation in PDF. On this PDF, uh, it's, my, it's, a, it's, a, it's a longer presentation I first prepared, but oh, of course, 10 minutes were not enough. There you have all the links to different, uh, to different parts of what I talked about. Uh, I suggest you first explore that. And if uh, that's not enough, uh, please, um, uh, Sally, share now uh, my, my, my email. And I'd be very glad to uh, help anyone that has further questions or needs to find uh, things I talked talked about, I will be very glad to 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 help them through through email. Ah, oh, that's fantastic, Edward. I'll, I'll take out your email and, and share it in the uh, chat section. Uh, for for all the our audience, I've put the link to our web page in the chat uh, bar, and that I we've uploaded uh, Eduardo's PDF and a link to his longer talk there. So. You can follow up there, Mustafa. Okay, thank you. Actually, I've, I had a couple of questions for you as well, Eduardo. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> so, I don't. Is there easy? My... I don't mind. <laughs> I promise. So I wanted to know. I wanted to. Maybe it's cheeky, not easy. So I wanted to know which which aspects of teaching online that you personally enjoy the most. What you get the most out of, and and which parts are the most frustrating as an educator. Well, well, the, the, the part I like most is that it allows us to do uh, active learning. Mm. It allows us to teach at the time we, we, are, uh, we like to do it. I always get up at four o'clock in the morning. So that's, that's the moment I answer everything that's pending on the forums. And uh, also students, specifically when we're talking of CBD, when you talk of CBD, uh, learners are usually working. They're not full-time uh, learners. They need to do this when their work and their family obligations uh, do not, uh, are not pulling to, uh, from them. Mm -hmm. So the thing I, I most like is the possibility to do this for learners and teachers whenever they want and the other thing is that it adapts to the learner's state when they go into it because learners that have little experience on the topic can go in the presentations two or three times ask more questions those that are more competent in that they can just fast forward the videos or just skip them and go into the discussions or the assessments or whatever i think those are the things i value most as a as a fast forward yeah that, that that's a really great point about pers being able to being enabled to personalize learning you know as a conversation between the educator and the learner okay all right i've got all, i've got several more questions but i have to let it go eduardo because we're we've time is moving on and i want to make sure there's lots of time for uh judith's talk as well so thank you again and i really appreciate your time today for joining us it's been a, thank a great you. Time. Thank you Thank for you. the opportunity. Okay, so we're now going to move on to our second talk, um, and this is from uh, our second speaker is from joining us from South Africa. It's Associate Professor Dr. Judith McKenzie, who's an extremely experienced educator and researcher at the University of Cape Town.
She's head of the Disability Studies Division within the Department of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, and she convenes the Postgraduate Diploma in Disability Studies there. She's also responsible for supervision of masters and PhD students and has an active research program focusing largely on inclusive education, intellectual disability and family life. And she's the lead academic on the MOOC Education for All Disability, Diversity and Inclusion, which was developed by the University of Cape Town on the FutureLearn platform. So Judith is here today to actually share, her, mostly to, uh, to share her, I think, to share her experiences of uh, these MOOCs or massive open online courses. And just a quick word about those before we go on. Uh, MOOCs are free to access online courses uh, which are being developed in large numbers by universities around the world. And the aim is to extend the reach of higher education beyond the university walls. So they tend to have large numbers of students and a lot of the learning is um, uh, self-directed in, in the courses. And uh, UCT has a fantastic program of, of MOOCs available now. So Judith is going to talk about her experiences as an educator developing and delivering the MOOC she was involved with and also on the impact it's had on her research and teaching practice since. So again, please, as questions and comments come to you, please post them to Judith using either the chat bar or the question bar and we'll answer these in a Q&A afterwards. Okay, so let me hand over control to Judith. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Hi, Judith. Nice Welcome. Thank, Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, getting to my screen. I do believe. Yes, I can see your. Uh, I can see your screen now. You can see the yeah. screen. Yep, I can okay. see your slide. Great. Okay, I am not as expert at uh, webinars as Eduardo. So thank you, Eduardo, for the presentation and I've certainly learned a lot and um, love the professional way in which it was done. I think there's a skill to, to doing that and really being familiar with the technology. Um, so I'm talking about experiences with MOOCs and um, I would like to just look at this presentation in terms of firstly my own personal experiences that I've had with the MOOC and the motivation that um, I had to develop it and that we we felt the need for the MOOC and then something about what that development entailed and then finally just to look at some of the benefits and challenges that arise from uh, working in that MOOC space. So uh, starting off with my own personal experiences I found myself I've been involved in the area of inclusive education for many years and inclusive education for those who may be not so familiar with it is the uh, education of all children in the same classroom. So instead of special education for children with disabilities and regular education for those without, inclusive education looks at the ways in which education can be integrated for both children with and without disabilities. So what I found is that often we ask for help or advice and um, especially the requests would come from less well-resourced areas who really felt they wanted to do something in this area but um, were unable to find resources to assist them. So it, from our division there was a need to share and wanting to share but not having the time and many of the people making the requests were not people in a position to come and study with us but just needed some information to get them going. The other aspect that was important for me is that um, we, in running the postgraduate diploma on disability studies, we moved from a block release course um, where students would come for two weeks, go back and then come back for another two weeks and then come back and do the exam and then come back for another two weeks and go back and come, so come back and forth. And we moved that to a blended learning in which they would just come for two weeks and then the rest would be in online learning. And um, this was a full qualification, which is counted as a distance education in South Africa um, through our Council of Higher Education. But what was um, revealing to me was the level of audience interaction. I mean, not audience, uh, peer interaction that would happen in the online space, the discussion and the, the way that peers would um, co-construct knowledge with the facilitator and with each other. 
And um, so that was an, a revelation for me to see that. And then the other uh, personal experience is that the, the, there's such a willingness to learn out there and a dearth of knowledge, and yet we've got this, um, the internet, which is such a wonderful way to share. So, um, so as I say, I was impressed by the power of online engagement, especially as it allows in student interaction and co-creation co of knowledge. And then um, UCT sent out an offer for people to motivate to do um, courses. And, and um, stated that funding would be made available for course development. So that was motivating and we applied in that. And then the, um, the traction of the openness that the open courses are open technically, legally, culturally, pedagogically and financially. So it um, gave ultimate access, access. So in terms of legal, it was copyright in terms of um, culture, uh, Culturally, it was that we had the opportunity to bring in a, a full range of a whole range of cultures, and then pedagogical that it was um, we had um, a range of pedagogical techniques and financial being free, not being um, having any cost implications for the user. And then the other really thing that was important to us was reaching low to middle income countries. Um, and here we had a challenge because if you do, uh, sorry, I've, I've done something with my screen now. Um, um, here we had a challenge because if you look at the literature, what you find is that uh, MOOCs are often, um, um, they've often, while they've been held as an educational revolution and being able to reach people who might not have access to courses, um, the research reveals that, in fact, the users are mostly located in um, in high-income countries. Um, and this educational disparity is particularly stark in Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, all of which seem to be prime candidates for MOOC education. But in those countries, almost 80% of the MOOCs come from the wealthiest and the most well-educated 6% of the population. Um, so those were the motivations. And then we, through that motivation, fortunately, we were accepted to go on to the program and to be funded for it. And then we moved into the course development. And um, this was a really very, very interesting experience. And I learned a lot about teaching and about learning design, even having had a lot of experience in course development. The precision that's needed to develop a MOOC was very um, uh, enlightening. So it went, we, uh, in, relate, we had regular meetings to lay out and plan the MOOC. And we engaged with an NGO in the field of inclusive education and also shared their resources. Uh, I think if, when you're developing a MOOC, it really is time to make use of your networks. We found that people were very willing to be drawn in and to be part of it. Um, we had, it, it, as I said, clarity is the thing and the learning design team really pushes one for clarity. Um, so, uh, it, 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 we had to gain clarity on what is means starting from the beginning and we had to define our target group carefully and of course determine learning outcomes and assess them and as Chernovich pointed out copyright is something of a mystery to academics we just feel like we can use whatever we like and that was a challenge to learn about that as well and um, there's a lot of an administrative load, there's setting up appointments, there's arranging shoots, there's preparing scripts. So there is a lot of preparation to get the MOOC prepared and would not have been able to do that without the support of an assistant. So if you are in an academic position and you are thinking of doing a MOOC, then um, it, the one needs to be aware of the the real load that it does impose and we were lucky at UCT to have the funding to be able to employ somebody and the learning design team is critical we had an expert team at the center for innovation and learning and teaching which you call SILT at UCT 
then there was that what was the impact on my other, on other forms of teaching and i think it helped me a lot with the blended learning course just understanding how to facilitate more student engagement i also learned more about the importance of multimedia um not just the not only the powerpoint but using other sources as well and engaging students to discuss with each other i think what it also highlighted for me in an area that i still need to go more into and I, is the importance of digital literacies and i looked at belshaw which i won't go into now but he identifies these different elements of um, digital literacy so it's so much more than just being able to use the technology and it's so much more than just being able to um, post messages there are a whole lot of digital literacies which need to be drawn upon. I also found that um, coming from disability studies, uh, it was very important to us that the MOOC would be accessible to uh, people with disabilities. So people with visual impairment, which might be, of course, be of interest to Eduardo with the primary from the ophthalmic side, um, and also people with hearing impairments and um, even people with, uh, uh, not, uh, with low levels of um, language either second language speakers or, or through disability and we use then the notion of universal design for learning and we found that MOOCs are very well orientated for that and universal design for learning um, looks at representing the information that you need to present in in a range of ways visually auditory text um, in 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 a whole range of ways so that people can exercise their own learning style and use their own strengths and then um, multiple means of action and expression means that they're flexible methods of action in and express and expression to support their learning so that um, uh, participants might respond through a written text through a spoken text through a uh, posted video and so on so that multiple means of action and expression and then um, multiple means of engagement and that means it's the motivation getting the effective part of learning in why people actually learn so um, i think that that framework helps us to look at making it accessible there's just a screenshot of the mooc which is actually running at the moment it's i think the eighth run that it's on now um, and so the benefits um, um, the benefits that we've experienced is that uh, participants have uh, really benefited in ways that they've shared with us. Um, we've had emails and stories, of people that have like uh, come, come and said, oh, they've really found it helpful. Um, the MOOC also raises the prof profile of the division and as a lead academic, it also has uh, assisted me in my academic career. Um, we've made connections with other countries that is a fascinating part of MOOCs that you've got a global connection and um, a global dialogue we also find that students who do MOOCs have joined our program so we've uh, uh, gathered PhD students and postgraduate students who started off by doing the MOOC and then became interested in disability studies and this experience has, lay, has uh, led us to um, seek and to receive funding for a further four MOOCs which would be on education of children with disabilities so that we're doing a, um, a more advanced version of education for all and then we're doing a MOOC on um, education of children who are uh, deaf and hard of hearing children who have um, blind and have low vision and um, children with intellectual imp impairment. It's been nice to be able to bring in students as mentors. Um, they have, if they're doing work in inclusive education, they can uh, spend some time on the MOOC and get to know some of the issues and engage with students on there. And of course, there are also research opportunities. The challenges though, it's very time consuming to set up. Um, and as each run goes, so as I say, we're in the eighth run now, we, uh, but each time one wants to engage with it more, but it's a um, challenge to find the time to do that. And one wonders when one would actually update the course. Um, and then, of course, keeping up the momentum is a, an issue, is students tend not to complete. There's a funnel of participation with a large number starting and a few are coming out. For example, our first run, 9,104 um, 
participants registered, registered, but 724 actually finished the course with various degrees of participation in between. So whereas it is a, a very small proportion that actually finished, I think that you will agree that having 724 people go through a course is, is uh, it's reaching still a lot of people. And the others will still have gained from the incomplete participation. So in conclusion, I would just like to say that it's a very, I've had a very positive experience and um, it's been very supported by the university and we're grateful to SILT and to the VC Strategic Fund and just uh, also to acknowledge uh, my co-educator, Choma uh, Ojunwa and Inclusive Education South Africa, because as I say, it's very much a collaborative effort and can't be done on one's own. So I've raced through that, Sally, and um, I hope it hasn't been too quick. I'm not, uh, and I hope that I'm in my time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Judith. That was fascinating, and you were absolutely on time, and it didn't oh, feel raced at all. And um, and a lot of what you said. I'm a, a someone who is more of a learning designer, who's also who works with academics to create MOOCs, and so much of what you said uh, resonated with me um, yeah. about the the uh, need to the need for precision and so much work in the planning at the start. I think because the there's less teacher less ongoing teacher facilitation, you need to yeah. really plan how it's going to work at the start, don't you? And I actually had a with your with your completion rate, seven hundred twenty four people going through the course is amazing. And I want to, I have read recently that we shouldn't be looking at um the people who register for a MOOC as our learners, they're like the people who are thinking about buying our product. And it's the people who turn up that we should think of as our learners, which actually kind of will oh. double your completion rate. So, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And actually, I had to, I, one question I had for you was I, I recently went to a, a meeting. Um, uh, you use uh, Future Learn as the, the platform, and that's a real feature of MOOCs, isn't it? That academics, we kind of work with this. Uh, external commercial platform provider don't we so we move out yeah. of our Moodle or our or, or Vula and work with these these and they're quite commercial in how they think about things and they're very focused on um, how to make MOOCs sustainable so yeah. this meeting was all about maybe the taking the MOOCs we're creating and integrating them with our formal courses and I was very interested to see that you had come from a blended uh, a blended course and into developing MOOCs and my question when I get to it finally I apologize yeah. is do you, do you see uh, are you looking at integrating the MOOC back into the blended formal course is that something that's feasible or are they too different and the audiences are too different the learners and so on do you see a synergy between the two to help you with this you know managing the workload and making them more sustainable in future Yes, I, I do. The thing is that the, the MOOC has been slightly different to the aim of the, the blended course. So it hasn't mm -hmm. really been a, a fit exactly. But interestingly enough, we have um, the MOOC that's running now, this run now, the University of Johannesburg. Um, they Their education students have been, uh, they need to do, they've been told that they need to do the MOOC. So they are integrating it. It's another university, and they're integrating yeah. it into their postgraduate program. So it's quite interesting how how, how that interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but we I haven't done that yet. It's early days, isn't it? There's a lot yeah. of change going on, and yeah. and that was I've got bits of paper. I've written millions of notes. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> it's. Uh, I was very interested in Belshaw for di digital literacies is something we've been thinking about too, and we've been looking at. Uh, what the JISC, the uni UK Universities Information Literacy uh, Service, has been looking at. They've developed a set of competencies and capabilities that they feel UK students need to have for uh, higher education. Mm. And um, something I've, we've been talking about is is how cultural these, how how culturally mm. contextual these uh, capabilities and uh, digital literacies are. So, for example, here in the UK, there's a big emphasis on uh, managing your digital identity and making sure you, 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 you've got a professional digital identity because everybody's on social media chatting away and maybe mixing up their personal and uh, professional identities when they're students. Is that something that um, you see it in South Africa? 
Well, I think that, uh, you know, this MOOC, for example, was aimed at uh, low and middle income countries. So a lot mm. of our uh, participants are not very sophisticated in terms, mm. a lot of them are, but there are uh, many that are not that sophisticated in the um, digital technologies. Mm. And I think that we haven't taken sufficient note of the elements of um, digital literacy and kind of use the MOOC itself to develop those skills as as we go as we go along and as we go through it, so I think it takes a lot more um, thought and certainly with uh, online with full qualifications it's even more of an issue because mm -hmm. they use people who have paid the fees and who are uh, uh, ready for full qualification and are with different levels of preparedness for the digital element. So in that we do spend a lot of time. We spent uh, like uh, two weeks and we have ongoing support all the students uh -huh. uh, and, and that, but that takes so i would say we're probably more the other way sally is that um, uh, people are quite unsophisticated a lot of people are quite unsophisticated in the digital world and okay certainly, um, certainly in the formal courses obviously in the mooc you have the full range yeah yeah i think that's a really important point that you i i and I just made it. I just made that mistake. I think in my question of not lumping our students together in in great heaps, that there's a lot of difference uh, between a cohort in 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 amongst a cohort of students, and that will change over time as well. Yeah. Okay. I see. I can see time running on. So I'm. Although I could ask both you and Eduardo many more questions, <laughs> we will lose our audience one by one. So I'm going to. So I'm going to thank you very much, Judith. That was extremely interesting, and I'm going to wrap up now. So thank you very you. much. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks. Great. Okay. Bye. Bye. So I'm. Um, thank you to both our presenters and. Um, you should get an email in a few days with the links to this recording and a transcript and please share them and also please if i could just finish off by showing our last screen uh join us next time um when we're going to look at uh digital technologies from the learner's point of view from our from, for health professionals so we we have another um faculty member from cape town miss veronica mitchell will be talking about uh the digital skills and tools that health professionals uh, need to support their technology enhanced learning. And she's actually going to talk, I think, a bit more about the dig digital skills and literacies we've touched on here, which I also talked about in our first webinar in a very sort of broad sense. So if you're interested in seeing the first webinar uh, or the re or transcript or in signing up for the next one, which I very much encourage you to do, please visit this web page. And I have stuck the link in the chat as well and find out more. And so I'm going to finish now and I'd like to finish finally by thanking Eduardo and Judith again for two really interesting webinars. Thank you very much. Okay.